My name is Prajwal Parajuli, and it is an absolute honor to be moderating this session on caste, color, and gender. Let me quickly introduce our panelists. Margot Jefferson has won the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism and also the National Book Critics Circle Award for her book, Negro Land. She teaches writing at Columbia University. Yashika, in the middle, is a journalist and the author of Coming Out as Dalit. She's a graduate of St. Stephen's College in Delhi and the Columbia Journalism School. She now works in advertising. Dr. Sharmila Sen is the editorial director at Harvard University Press. She has also taught English at Harvard and is the author of Not Quite, Not White. <laughs> I have spent the last two weeks immersed in these books and have emerged a wiser, sometimes badly shaken person. In addition to examining and analyzing a system that is often designed to exclude, the writings depict how much systemic discrimination deprives one of one's humanity. Reading this, these books was as much a cultural, historical, anthropological eye-opener as it was a window into the very personal journeys of these writers, told sometimes with humor, sometimes in justified rage, but always with poignancy, lyrical dexterity, and sincerity. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our authors with a round of applause. Yashika, we'll start with you. After a lifetime of passing as a so-called upper caste person, a suicide in the Indian city of Hyderabad triggered you to own your Dalitness, which eventually led you to writing your book. Could we talk about that a little bit? Sure. So um, I came here in 2014, and I had spent a lifetime pretending to be an upper caste person, lying about my identity, went through an extensive process of changing my last name. Um, anytime somebody asked me about my caste, I would often give the wrong answer. I would say I was a Brahmin, which is the highest upper caste in India. Um, and when I came here, when I came to Colombia, and my professors are here, so I'm really happy about that. They helped me understand systemic discrimination and privilege. And that began opening my mind to how maybe I shouldn't be so ashamed of who I am, because I was until then. And I was still processing these ideas. I graduated in May. And in January, I read about the suicide uh, institutional murder of this Dalit student, who basically had to kill himself because he wanted to oppose the discrimination that was going on in the university. And I avoided looking at it for a couple of days because it, I knew it would be a powerful thing. But when I did finally one day sitting in Chelsea in a coffee shop and I read the letter once, twice, it's like one of those moments when everything stops and it's just you and the thing in front of you. And that was it. I had never read a Dalit person write in English. I had never read a Dalit person write in English so beautifully. And English, as we will discuss later probably, is really important to us asserting our identity. And that's when I realized that this is something that I need to confront. My identity as a Dalit person is something that I need to take into stock, especially because I made it so far. I made it to Colombia. This person could have been me. I could have been Rohit Vamula. Had there been some twist in fate, some different circumstances, I would have been able to, I would have been forced to commit suicide maybe. I don't know. So I realized that I needed to do something with all this education that I had. And so I decided to start a Tumblr. Um, Tumblr was really popular in 20. 16. So, <laughs> everything that I read in media was about reservation or violent and brutal oppression of Dalits, but there was something that existed in the middle that I was not reading. Why, why did it take me about 30 years to read a Dalit person's writing in English? And then I decided to start this Tumblr. It was called 
documents of Dalit discrimination. And I wanted to invite people to talk about their stories of oppression, of microaggressions, of what it feels like to live in this middle space when you have relative privilege, but life's not easy yet. So um, I decided to launch it, but I realized that I can't ask anyone to tell their own story until I told my own. But because I'd read Vemula's letter, it gave me so much courage, and it was such a defining moment in life, which is why I think Dalit stories and Dalit narratives have so much power that it changed my life in that instant, and I was ready to tell the world about who I was. And um, I wrote a note on Facebook, and I told my friends, my family, my acquaintances, everybody I'd known that far. In fact, I was really happy because I knew that some of them would be filled with rage, that a Dalit person had sat between them, eaten at the same table, and there is, for those of us who are not aware, there is a huge discrimination when it comes to food about Dalits, had been friends with them, and they couldn't recognize me. So I was very happy in that moment when I was pressing that button, sitting in front of my laptop, I was ecstatic because I knew that those people would be, would be furious. And, um, and I launched that Tumblr, and then it took a life of its own, and I got lots of stories where people talked about how they felt the same way and how there had not been a space so far for them to talk about that, and that Tumblr at least gave them that. So that's how I came out as Dalit. What, what, what was the reaction of your friends and family like? Uh, close friends already knew. Okay. My family, I think I've mentioned that in the book as well. My mom um, was afraid. And I've written a lot about in the book how my mom was one of the key people who told me, who taught me how to pass as an upper caste person because she didn't want me to have a hard life the kind of life that she led, the kind of life that everybody else who's out in the open in India as a Dalit person leads. So um, when I decided to do that, I realized that I, I needed to talk about what it meant to be a Dalit person in today's India. And I just, I want to know what exactly is the question uh, that if you can ask me again, what was the question that Are you asked? reaction of friends and family? My you, reaction yeah, to my yeah. friends and family. I get so carried away, I'm sorry. <laughs> My mom, when she realized um, that I, I decided, she didn't know that I posted this on Facebook. And my mom wasn't on Facebook till then. The only time I decided to tell her when I was appearing live on an interview on a national television channel in India. That's uh, not a good daughter move, not a good Indian daughter move at all. But, but I called her up and I said, uh, hey, I'm going to be on an interview, can you watch it? And I thought I'm going to hoodwink her and say, oh, I'm, I'm getting on TV, get the news through there, I don't have to confront you at all. But she ended up missing that interview, <laughs> so it didn't work out. And, and then I had to call her, and she said, what was the interview? Were you doing some fashion segment? I was a fashion reporter before I moved to uh, New York. And I said, no, I just went on live TV and told everyone I'm Dalit. <laughs> and my mom, there was a moment of silence, and her first question was, um, will you get jobs after this? Will anyone hire you? And I said, well, if, as long as I don't go back to India, I think it should not be a problem. Uh, and then I could sense that from the other end of the line, she was crying, and I could hear her, her sobs, and, and she said, I'm really proud of you. Um, what I wasn't able to do in my lifetime, you did that, and it really means a lot. So that was a big moment. Thank you, Yashika. Thank you. Uh, Sharmila, you arrived in America in August 1982 as a 12-year-old. In the book, you talk about how you got raised the way some people get chicken pox the way you get a cell phone or a pair of shoes. Could you, could you throw some light on it? I, uh, yours is such an interesting journey. It's such a fascinating journey. I'd love for the audience to know all about it. Um, well, I, I was born in India, and um, I grew up with many different ways in which people um, put each other in boxes and try to make sure that people stay in their boxes, in a society full of many kinds of hierarchies, of course, of 
language, uh, religion, social class, ethno-linguistic group, gender. But the one thing we didn't have, as I write in the book, is race. And there is a reason, and particularly an American vocabulary of race, and there's a historic and even a political reason for that. Um, independent India has not included race as a category in its census since the first census. So someone of my generation, uh, we did not grow up in the way, it's if I was born in the US, I would have just grown up. It would have been very much part of my life. But in 1982, when I came to America as a young girl, uh, race was everywhere. And everybody was rushing to ask me to tick a box, or many boxes. Um, and it was, uh, that's why I said, I said, you know, well, the way one gets chicken pox, it's like you're infected with it. Uh, the way you get a pair of shoes, you try it on for size. Or the way you get a new cell phone, it's something to communicate with. And, um, and I think, you know, one of the ways, of course, as I've lived all these years and worked in the US, uh, we both get it and then we try to unget it, particularly the privilege of the education I had, you know, everybody. And I was surrounded by, of course, people who didn't see race, uh, even while I was being asked to tick all the boxes. And um, I wanted to really write about how being, becoming American, which for me was not just about learning how to speak the way you hear me speak today, or dress the way you see me dress today, or uh, change my citizenship, which I eventually did, which took a lot of time and thinking because India doesn't have dual citizenship, so I had to actually um, surrender my citizenship, which my grandparents' generation had fought, so we could have it. Um, but become a citizen, but even that, I'm not sure that made me American until I sort of, you know, got race, because I think there is something that's a quintessential part of the way we are American. Um, and it's also, of course, a, a story about what it means to accept, and there are many people like me, not just from uh, the subcontinent, but from other places in the world who come to the US, who silently accept what I call the honorary badge of uh, white adjacency, right? Yes. And without about thinking about what that means. So, you know, to what it means to be white adjacent, what it means to kind of pass, you know, Perhaps not in your way, Yashika, I did not actually tell anybody I was white. But if it was assumed or if I was seen as, you know, uh, as kind of white, I accepted that. And what, what did that mean? And it took me 35 years to understand sure. what the cost of that was. Margot, the million dollar question. I, I happened to read Margot's book on the subway on three different occasions. And there were a few funny looks thrown my way, a few angry looks. Could you tell us a bit about why you titled the book what you did? Well, um, <laughs> uh, I wanted to suggest or represent um, with that title a number of things. One, I was uh, taking advantage of the fact that Negro capitalized was once the most respectful uh, term chosen by Negroes, Blacks, African Americans, um, ourselves as the preferred term, as long as it was capitalized. Um, it, of course, it, it supplanted because names, um, even when they're not insulting, are markers of, um, well, a people who are discriminated against, from discrimination to racism, to various exclusions, you are, one of the things you're always struggling for is to be named and referred to and identified with respect. Um, and you know, this is a, a restless shift, um, which we can track in the census, um, too, and in immigration um, battles and struggles. There was colored. Um, which is a kind of euphemism, <laughs> very, very much so. So that was a kind of genteel term in the, um, that dominated the, particularly among black, um, the black bourgeoisie, black privileged classes, black intellectuals. Um, it was a way, it was a form of white adjacency. We're, we're colored. 
you know, you don't really have to think of us as so opposed. Then Negro, which of course in you know, very other languages like Spanish and Portuguese essentially means black, but it took on its, its own somewhere between um, colored and black because black was considered um, among our people um, a major insult. Um, and then black power brought black in and then African American. Um, replaced that. I was writing, so I, I wanted to kind of shock readers into an awareness of the boundaries and the limits and the ambitions of um, linguistic proprieties um, for um, people who are discriminated against. Um, and I wanted um, to signify also again, the white adjacency, the, the propriety of this particular world that I was born into and raised in. Um, again, the world of the black bourgeoisie, the, which variously calls itself, it doesn't really like to call itself the black bourgeoisie or the Negro or the color, it likes to call itself an elite. Um, so, you know, those words too, I wanted to prepare my readers for all those um, distinctions, those denotations and connotations. And I also wanted that sense um, of land as something that um, we as a people longed for, for its cultural and political and social um, heritage. Whatever um, bigotry, discrimination takes place in your homeland, it remains your homeland. Um, that's why there was, in certain ways, that's one reason Indian history could escape, um, you know, official declarations of race. So I wanted that sense of longing, and I also wanted to signify that black cultural, historical communities, whether it's a question of segregated neighborhoods or simply things that you share politically and culturally, you know, there is that sense um, of a land, um, of a homeland that um, you were joined together in. So. It, I wanted it to signify many, many, many things. <laughs> it works. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, um, binaries that kind of poised with these spaces in between them that people are always trying to navigate. Excellent. You know, your, your dad was a pediatrician. You grew up upper middle class or upper class, depending on whom depending you are. Depending on who wanted to call it what. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your, your mom said you were... My oh, mother your mom was said, a, just say we're comfortable. Right? My mother did not want us to say, you know, it's again, it's, it's one, the habits that you learned by, you know, passing for Brahmin that you learned with your privilege. A, a lot of it, it, it's speech patterns, it's manners, it's, it's what you don't say as much as what you do say. So it was considered nouveau and vulgar to say we were rich, and also my mother knew we weren't, um, <laughs> to be practical. Um, and you know, to be a black person of some privilege and to be vulgar, which was one of the slurs assigned really as an essential trait to black people, was utterly forbidden. So in my world, these parsing of these little manners particulars that went from, you say, comfortable instead of rich, and you really aren't supposed to ask anyone that question, you learn not only so-called standardized English, you learn to modulate your voice, which also has to do with gender, you know? <laughs> um, the courteous, um, you know, level, um, voice level. You don't shout, you don't kind of slump when you laugh. You know, there were this extreme codes of manners that made it possible for us to be, um, try to be, not quite. <laughs> well, I love the way your title plays, you know, with grammar, with meaning, but not quite, not quite in that particular way. Um, but also, of course, we were always not quite. Yeah. <laughs> so any meaning you give it, um, it signifies. And you know, you could, there was a kind of social and psychological passing you could do even if you were clearly, um, as for example, I am a person of color. Um, you know, in the 50s, the big compliment would be in your white schools. And your, you know, I don't think of you as black, you know, because you seem so, you know, we get along, we talk about the same things, we go to movies, your voice sounds like mine, your parents have the same kinds of professions. So I don't think of you as this 
caste, in a sense, caste like other. You spoke about English. And, of course, if uh, I didn't, somewhere I wouldn't have to say that. <laughs> That's another issue. Yeah. Yashika and Sharmila, English figures prominently in both your books. Sharmila, you mentioned that English is your third language and your relationship with it has constantly changed now that you are the mother of three native speakers of English. Yashika, you mentioned that uh, uh, your mom drilled in you that learning to speak the right way was the, was the key to circumvent questions about your caste identity. Could we touch up on that a little? Could we start with you, Yashika? Yeah, for sure. So um, it was important to me, to, for me to learn English, but to not just learn, to speak it better than anyone else, because that would automatically mean I was upper caste. Just like what you said, Margo, there are these indicators that don't need to be quite said. English, at least in the Indian subcontinent, is an indicator that you already have privilege, that you have access to networks, and you have access to class. Because we didn't, I mean, we have cable television now, but even in the 90s when I grew up, you could only learn English if your parents knew it or if you went to a certain school. So that's why it was important for me uh, growing up uh, there is, uh, to learn English. There is an incident that I mentioned in the book where uh, it was drilled in me to speak, to, to learn the correct names of fruits and vegetables. And I knew the correct name for dates, just khajur. Uh, South Asians will know. And once when I was five or six, I, spo I, I called a uh, Kajura date uh, in front of my relatives and uh, people who were not clearly Dalit. And the respect, the begrudging respect that I remember noticing in their faces was an indicator to me at five or six that if I knew English, they wouldn't treat me differently. They would treat me with respect. That alone would take me to places that I would not be able to be go to on my own. So that's why it was, and, and it has helped. I mean, look where we are. I wrote a book in English. Um, I'm at, uh, in New York. I work uh, at an advertising agency. I write in English. So it's really been um, instrumental to my journey that I spoke English the correct way. And I learned how to do it in the right way, speak it in the right tone and manner, and essentially do it better than most people so that people wouldn't even question what my caste was. And that really helped with me passing as an upper caste person, as you asked earlier, because I looked upper caste. And what that meant, and a lot of people ask me, what does it mean that you look upper caste? It means that I can speak English well. And I don't have to have an accent, but just the words that I use. And I look with it, to use a really archaic term. Um, and that's what it means. That's why English was fundamental, that I led a life that my mom didn't lead. Sharmila, there's a, there's a lovely line in your book that goes along the lines of, between Labor Day 1982 and Christmas 1982, I was determined to acquire a new accent. Oh, yes. This, <laughs> I love that. This yes. is someone who landed in America on August the 12th, 1982. <laughs> uh, with, with not as much access to, with, with not very much access to Hollywood uh, movies in Calcutta, I'm guessing. I, I, actually, I think I, uh, my, my parents were great cinephiles, so I, I had seen uh, many. But, but okay. yes, please continue. I, I was uh, certainly yeah, an you, overachiever. Did you, did you succeed <laughs> in it? Could you, could you talk to us? Well, I'd, I'd like to think I, I did, of course. I mean, now we have to go and find uh, my uh, classmates from uh, seventh grade to see <laughs> did I or didn't I. Had, I had a great advantage of youth. Uh, a 12 year old had learned. Uh, language much faster. Uh, I, I think I did have a, just a kind of a, a certain, uh, it's just a kind of a freak of nature. I'm, I'm, I'm quick at picking up languages. I have an ear, so I, I pick up a lot of languages fast. But this one, I was entirely determined. You know, I, I, I got my, you know, it was not, those of you here who are old enough to remember that era I can't quite see in the dark. You know, I, I got an asymmetrical haircut, I pegged my pants, I had to figure out, you know, uh, what, what popular music I was going yes. to like. Right. Because it's, uh, this is uh, grade school, 
in America. There's nothing cool about being the foreign kid. And certainly I was not coming from the right foreign country. Exactly. Um, I mean, we did have a few others in my class that year. You know, there was a, there was a nice young girl, Katya, from Switzerland, and there was Etienne from France. You know, they were the cool countries. So their accent was, was cool. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and children, there's a kind of a shrewd cl- clumsiness by which children can assess a situation. You know, that they're sort of little anthropologists. So yeah, that's yeah. what I was. I was observing the natives of this country because I wanted to go native. Uh, <laughs> just as, as Englishmen once had in my country <laughs> yes. a, a century ago. Yeah. Yeah, you, you also talk about how uh, going native was largely what men did. And oh. was, was, it, was it difficult for you, as a, was it more difficult for you as a girl to go native than it would have been for a 12-year-old boy? No, I think I, I meant that in, in a kind of historic sense. Okay. There, I'm, okay. I'm sort of speaking about the history of colonization. And generally, going native is what white men do. And, and in a way, what white men do is what going native is. There are many instances of, of course, uh, European women you know, uh, picking up the customs of some country in the darker climes, but it prov- that causes sexual problems. So, you know, so going native, if you think of the great kind of, you know, famous men who've gone native and think, is there a female version of that possible? Who is the female Richard Burton? You know, who is, I mean, other than uh, those of you who know British history, other than... Uh, Lady Mary Wortley Montague. There, there are oh, very right. few That's right. That's women I know who could do it because it involves going into intimate spaces of another culture. Yeah. And that's where it becomes difficult. But for me, in the late 20th century, no, indeed, I think it was perhaps even a little easier because I think, I think how a young brown girl navigates this country. And I didn't use words like brown back then. I don't think, did we have that as a color? Uh, I'm I just think joking. I know. I'm just. I mean, of course, brown existed as a color, but, no, no, but it I wasn't a thing in the '80s, right? But the way I think someone uh, from the subcontinent, I think it might even be a little easier for for a young girl to 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 blend in. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I would actually say the same thing in certain ways yes. about young black girls. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, for going native in the sense of going bourgeois white and being hip. About yes, it, just, yes, yeah. yes, and, that, and achieving, achieving that white adjacency and that kind of, and the kind of the little frisson, your, your, dis, your difference. Because we carry our difference, too, in very subtle ways, right. only to be shown at certain moments. But I think there's a way in which, let's be honest, I think there's a way in which women can capitalize on yes, it. Yes, it can be joined yeah. with the tropes of normality and right. seem very delightful. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that was, that was fantastic. I'm sorry. Thank that's, you. That that's was, hard on you. No, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's harder on you? We're well, not what's harder than you. That's what yeah, we're saying. Well, we mean, had other problems elsewhere. There are other things that should be harder for yeah. men than Yes, yes it's about the only Some time we will say. Some men. should be harder for men. That's right. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> M- uh, Margo, uh, yeah. on the issue of gender again, uh, you mentioned that a privilege that was never readily granted to the girls of Negro land was that of being able to yield to mental illness, being able to yield to depression. Could we? I think that this, it has, it has emerged since I wrote this book, that this, um, for, you know, the, the legacy, this question of, um, of depression, of melancholy, of um, suicidal longings is very charged among um, peoples who are supposed to be constantly advancing and upholding, advancing their race, their group, what, um, upholding its virtues, standing always for progress and something larger than themselves. This, it seems, um, I was write about, writing about it as a black woman, that it is something I have since found um, in many communities of color as I've talked to people. It's, it's almost a verboten. It's like we cannot allow, we can't allow failure of any sort. I mean, the, the child in the family who didn't go to college or, you know, kept dropping out of this or that, that's always a problem. But um, it's as if um, these, these signs of 
psychic, um, psychological um, crisis and distress. It's really it is as if it's, it's saying, the white man has gotten to you. They, you know, they've dealt the fatal blow, you know, and we can't, it's too shameful, we can't recover from it. Yeah. Uh, Yashika, you also mentioned that. I mean, that, I'm sorry, that yeah. suicide of, but he was a man. He was a man. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Nev- and, but nevertheless, that's. It's a community issue. Yes. And I, I'm so glad you were And I'm sure me. some people felt how shameful that he couldn't carry oh, on. Oh, that, that is the ever-present narrative, even, and I'm giving you Dalit community secrets right now, yeah. that uh, people said, why did he give up? Exactly. Why, why yes. couldn't he go on fighting against the system? Why was he weak? Yeah. Exactly. And that weakness that it's almost flung at us like an abuse. Mm-hmm. You cannot afford to be weak. If you are Dalit and you have this kind of responsibility that you just need to keep moving forward, you cannot, you cannot be a person who has mental illness, mental issues, who goes through trauma. And um, I'm not sure if that's what you were asking, but that's one of the reasons I started Documents of Dalit Discrimination to talk about the trauma of passing, this constant need to be somebody we are not, the constant need to learn mannerisms, to learn language, to learn how people make their beds, which is what I did when I went to boarding school, to learn how upper caste girls make their beds so that nobody would tell me that I wasn't upper caste. That takes a toll on you, on your psyche. And exactly how you said, this, we, we don't allow ourselves to fail. And I experienced that as well growing up, and I think lots of therapy has helped now, uh, that, I, um, that I don't feel that I'm not doing enough. There was always this idea that I should be doing more. Me and other Dalit women mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Dalit men, we should be doing more. We, we can't fail. We, can't, we have to be better than we are, and we can never, ever show that we're not doing okay. You know, Yashika, I uh, was at the festival party yesterday and I had the pleasure of talking to a slightly inebriated gentleman who, who schooled me on why reservations, which is our version of the affirmative action in India, you know, uh, shouldn't be the order of the day, that reservations should be done away with completely. You have written an entire chapter on... Uh, why reservations are, are needed. I told the gentleman to come to this session. I'll guarantee you he's not here. Uh, uh, so we will not be able to teach him anything there. But could you, could you talk a little about why uh, you think reservations are not just uh, good, but they're needed. They're absolutely needed. Right. So let's understand what reservation is for my South Asian friends to begin with, who are probably against reservation. Reservation is just an affirmative action policy that lowers your marks in schools and government schools, government colleges, and government jobs so that you can enter those institutions. But people who are so opposed to reservation often fail to remember that uh, about 90% population, let's talk about America, Asian Indians, we call them Asian Indians now, call ourselves Asian Indians, 90% are upper caste. Only 10% are Dalits. I don't think we stop and question why. If I were to go around the audience asking who who among here was non-South Asian and had Dalit friends, I think only my friends would raise their hands. Because we don't know any Dalit people. And that's the fact is it was so hard for somebody like me. I uh, come from two generations of education privilege. And we call it education privilege because before that, Nobody in my family was allowed to, to learn how to read and write. I was able to make it here, and it was a difficult journey. I can't imagine what it takes for somebody who doesn't have their grandfather in the civil services to be able to get access to schools. And we don't even have to go that far behind. Let's look at what's happening in universities in India right now. We're called quota students. Quota is uh, the general term for reservation. When a student, no matter what background they come from, gets into school, there is a ragging process, which is the initiation. And they're told to sit on the ground when their non-quota students, a euphemism for upper caste students, sit on chairs. And those quota students are supposed to 
give an explanation or build a case for why they deserve a well, seat here. Would this happen in the bigger cities in India? It, Absolutely. Okay. It's happening in bigger cities and universities. I've mentioned it in the book. There's research for that. So there's a, the differences are already sewn in from the moment you enter as they spend four years, three years in that school. They live with the idea, they live with that shame that I'm taking someone else's seat. And forget them, I thought that. When I went to school in 2004 at St. Stephen's, I thought I was taking a deserving kid's seat. And like I said earlier, I think people should absolutely remember that Brahmins, which is the upper caste, according to surveys, are 5% of total Indian population. But if you look at how many Brahmins are CEOs, how many Brahmins run companies, how many Brahmins are bureaucrats, I'm sure you would say they're way more than 5%. Nobody looks at the reservations for uh, connections, resources, wealth, privilege. Those are reservations. What we are getting is affirmative action. And if people want to take away from that from us, it's because there is this idea that Dalits shouldn't have access to education. And that I... Uh, as South Asians will, among us will know, that uh, discrimination against education has been a law, a fundamental law of caste system. Indians weren't allowed, uh, Dal Dalit Indians weren't allowed to read and write, like I mentioned, and the attack on reservation system is a direct attack on Dalits getting more education. They say, oh, there are too many of you now. There are too many of you getting successful. We are 25% of India's one billion plus population, and there are too many of us who are getting educated, that argument does not make any sense. So I wish that gentleman was here, I would speak to him in person, but, yeah. uh, but He's not here, I know, he, I knew he wasn't gonna be here. I think he was there for the free wine, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, since this is a literature festival, I, I would love to talk a little about books, uh, which figure prominently in all the three of your books. Uh, there's a Little Women in Margot's book and yours. And there's also, uh, at the risk of sounding ignorant, I have to say, I was not uh, familiar with the writings of James Weldon Johnson. Oh, love it. Oh, Can we, we both love it. <laughs> I loved oh. when you took yeah. autobiography yeah. of the next color. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yes. both of you uh, uh, were clearly impacted by his book. You, you quote him liberally. I wouldn't be surprised if one of you even knew some of the passages by heart. Uh, oh, <laughs> you know, could we, could we talk about his writings and why they were so important to you when you were growing up? It was uh, Sharmila. Well, you know, he was, um, to situate him uh, kind of historically and politically, he was um, a colleague and a peer of W.E.B. Du Bois's. Uh, he was... Um, a politician. He was secretary of the NAACP for a time. He, he edited um, progressive... The first black secretary. The first yeah. black secretary. Um, that's right. Black, that's in your NAACP. book. That's yeah. right. Um, he was a poet. He was a critic. Um, he wrote quite interestingly about use of um, what was then called dialect, what we would now call black vernacular. He reviewed many books. He was a musician. He wrote with his brother, who was a composer, um, some of the early turn of the late 19th, early 20th century black musicals you know, that certainly preceded um, Shuffle Along, you know, the 1920s. So, um, and he was an author of this, it came out in 1912 anonymously. So, you know, the, the performative aspect of this and the hybrid fiction, nonfiction aspect of this feels very advanced. He wrote a novel in, under the, in the shape of, under the guise of, an autobiography by a white man called autobiography, well, by an ostensibly white man called autobiography of an ex-colored man. And it told the story in first person of this child of a black woman, former slave, and the gentleman slave master, who is pale skin with very pretty dark hair, he can pass, and he, just, he lives his life first as a privileged young boy of color who looks white, and then as he gets older, it's too elaborate to plot, he realizes, particularly goaded by the trauma of witnessing a lynching, that he ought to live, he's going to live, needs to live as a white man, 
to do this, he renounces a promising career as um, a ragtime composer who's going to turn ragtime, as Scott Joplin eventually did, into a form of classical music. Um, but you know, it's, um, it's an astonishing document of all of the, and I'm using document loosely, of the psychological, political, sociological network of choices that are not entirely choices, um, that go into the construction of racial identity. And coming out in 1912, um, you know, it, 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 it burst open you know, a series of, of, of sorry myths about mixed race people and the tragic mulatto. And um, you know, it's just a series of very he's, fixed stereotypes. And he's, and he's so ahead of his time. So I know we've suddenly t hijacked this. Yeah, we have, but, 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 we're, but, but we're you not know going. it's a literature festival, so I should say, I mean, this is one of the of, of, of all the American letters, you know. He's, a, he's one of the greats of what we would call the American letters. And across, and, yes, and every, and every Yes, meaning, across every, every form, and this is autobiography of an ex-colored man I took as a chapter, and I called one of my chapters autobiography of an ex-colored woman. Yeah. And uh, because, to quote another great American uh, writer, uh, I'll just paraphrase and Emily Dickinson and say, tell the truth, but tell it tell slant. Tell it slant. Exactly. Because that's what memoir is. You know, yes. if you think we are, we're yeah. just some sort of three women sitting here giving you verisimilitude, there's art, right? And, and sometimes I think that it's, it's the telling it slant. That's right. That is where some of our, our stories lie. That's and right. these stories of inclusion and exclusion that, um, and I learned it. I learned it from that slim little book. It's available, oh. by the way. It's a, it's a very easy to find paperback. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a great, great classic to revisit. It is, it is well, uh, it you is should indeed. all read his book, and you should all read their books. They will now be available for signing <laughs> uh, right outside. We unfortunately do not have time for questions because this conversation, as you know, could have gone on for another seven hours. And this was an excellent conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, audience. This was lovely. Um, no questions.